Hello and welcome back to the Rafty Mills Connection. Allow me to introduce my next guest with quite possibly one of the most recognisable voices in the UK and doing voiceovers for many adverts for both radio and television. You know him best, however, as E4 VoiceOver. My guest is keeping busy with his career but has graciously taken time out of his very busy schedule to speak to me. Ladies and gentlemen, my, my guest is Peter Dixon. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, and who would have believed it? I'm <laughs> actually on the Rafferty Mills connection. <laughs> Bloody hell! Brilliant! How are you doing, my friend? <laughs> I'm very good, thanks. I don't speak I don't speak like this all the time, you know, but um, I'm persuaded to do so um, when I'm in the studio for money. So uh, <laughs> there's nothing there's no there's no greater motivator is there than cash. <laughs> That's the best way, huh? <laughs> Now, uh, before I get with this interview, you know, I was telling a few people I was doing this interview, and my brother said to me, he said, Nick, you've got to get him to say ruddy hell. I think we've we ticked that box, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it again. Ruddy hell! <laughs> Brilliant. That's all I need. Okay. <laughs> now, thank you for being with me, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so it's, not, it's my pleasure, and hello to uh, everyone uh, listening to the uh, Rafferty Mills podcast. Thank you. Now, uh, my first question is, how did you get started with voice acting? Well, I've always been interested in radio, and uh, my career started out in, in, uh, in radio, so I, I started out in, in local radio, and well, actually, first of all, it was hospital radio, so I guess uh, we're all anoraks at heart, really, aren't we? Um, I, I, I did actually used to wear an anorak when I presented my show on hospital radio, so I really had the bug completely and, and, and acted the part. But yeah, hospital radio started out in then local radio, then regional radio, and then I went into um, uh, TV, and then I moved into back to radio again, to Radio 2, and I had about eight or nine years as Terry Organ's newsreader. And when I was sort of working in London, I got to approached by quite a lot of people to do commercials. And in those days, the BBC newsreaders, because I was a newsreader in those days, this is in the late 80s, um, you weren't really allowed to do commercial because it was deemed to be a conflict of interest. So I resigned my post as a newsread as as newsreader on Radio Two and went for completely freelance and started doing commercial voiceover sessions and loved it so much that found it really interesting and challenging and uh, you know just fun to do different voice characters and so on and so forth. And then I started working with Steve Wright on Radio One, did loads of voice telephone voice voice characters for his show and, and kind of you, you ask, I guess your reputation just grows and um, people just keep asking you to do it again and so I've just continuously been in continuously in work since uh, since I actually left university, which is you know quite a long time ago. Is voice acting something that you can kind of be trained to do? Because I'm always seeing stuff like the voice acting schools over in the United States, or is it something you kind of have to have a talent for? I think there's yeah, there's, it's an interesting question whether you can actually train somebody to do it. A lot of people have the make the mistake of thinking they have to have a beautiful voice uh, or an interest, you know, a really you know deep, rich brown voice, or women have to have a very sort of sort of sonorous voice to do voiceover work. And it's not really the case. It's um, it's got really nothing to do with your voice quality at all. It's got to do with how you use that voice. In other words, how you interpret a piece of copy that's put in front of you to read. And hopefully, by the time you've been cast to do something, you know the casting director would have done his job properly. So you know you you should just sort of literally fall into it. Um, I find sometimes, very occasionally, I'll get jobs where I'm asked to do voices for things, and I, as soon as I look at the script, I know that I'm the wrong person for the job. You know, I could instantly see it. Somebody else would be better at it. I've never been gallant enough to say so. I've always <laughs> I've always had a go, and um, very often you never see the thing uh, on TV or radio or hear it on the radio. But uh, that you end up hearing somebody else doing it in the end of the day. But um, yeah, I, I think you, um, if you're thinking of a career in voiceovers, you should certainly you know listen to a lot of radio and television commercials and hear how how other people are doing it. And um, while not necessarily copying them, um, you know get an idea of how it's done. And certainly, if, if that's the career that you want to pursue, uh, it w would be worthwhile. Uh, going on one of these um, voiceover courses, several of which I know I run in London. 
Okay. Now, uh, I know you, you said before that you worked with Steve Wright, who, by the way, I think is extremely talented. Uh, now, working with such a guy like Steve Wright, did you learn anything from him whilst working with him that uh, like kind of benefited you later on in your voice acting career? Oh, yes, yes, lots, yeah. He was, uh, when I first encountered Steve, he was doing the mid-afternoon show on Radio 1 in the mid-80s, mid this was, and he was pretty much uh, a maverick in those days. Um, he um, kind of built the audience up for his Radio 1 show to such an extent that it was, it was a huge audience in the afternoons uh, and it had never been done before in the afternoons because that was con that was almost sort of traditionally a graveyard slot between you know the breakfast show and the, and the drive time show were always the big ones and the mid-afternoon and mid-morning generally didn't tend to have a very big audience but he commanded huge audiences in the 80s so I really wanted to aligned myself with him and got, and, and got to know him quite well and we became very close friends and I learned an awful lot from him. He was, uh, well, there was nobody else in the UK doing quite what he did and he had a lot of imitators, um, um, of course, then and since and he changed the landscape of radio in this country uh, quite dramatically. Um, a lot of his ideas were taken from American radio, so he used to go to America, to New York and L.A. in particular, and, and he'd plunk himself down in a, in a hotel room literally on his own for a week. He'd take a, a week out and go over there and listen to radio solidly from when he got up to when he went to bed. And he'd sit in this darkened hotel room and, and he'd make notes and record stuff off the radio and come up with ideas and then bring all that back to the UK and, and replicate it over here. And, you know, these were the days when I guess people didn't travel as much as they used to, but as they do now, rather. And the ideas and the, the formats that he introduced, the zoo format on his show, nobody had done before over here. And it, it seemed very fresh and new. And uh, uh, and it's since been you know, copied endlessly up and down the country. I think they're still doing it in local radio shows I, I hear and in our breakfast shows you hear uh, the zoo format with presenter and two or three sidekicks Chris Moyles does it in the morning Terry Wogan <laughs> does it on radio too with, with his gang you know so it's uh, something that I think has had a lasting impact on the radio landscape over the last 20 years and he certainly started it all uh, you know, you were saying that he's very much American, uh, you know, that he went to America and learned this stuff. I think an example of that is that Ask Elvis segment that he does on his show, which is great as well. And uh, yeah. so it's very much that kind of thing where he's taking some of the stuff and uh, his ideas from America and then kind of using it for, for UK radio. So it's a nice concept as well. Yes. Yes, but uh, he used to take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. Good luck to him. Anyway, you know, he was he was a, he, he's he's a very uh, driven, uh, professionally very driven person, and uh, and he was uh, he was just delightful to be with. A uh, very funny guy, and um, you know, I, I I think I probably could say hand on heart that that the time I spent with him on Radio One and working around him and doing live gigs you know were among probably one of the the funniest times of my life really it was hilarious did you say you also did some work for uh, terry wogan yes i did i was a new i was a newsreader as i was employed as a staff announcer on radio too so my duties there were reading news uh, all right across the network and quite a lot of the time um, into terry wogan's show and and all the other shows across the network but i also did uh I had my own show. I took over from Jeremy Beadle on Radio 2. Did, I did Peter Dixon's Nightcap for an, a number of years, which was a, a Friday night, uh, late night Friday night show with uh, music and comedy. Uh, and then I, I've also done lots of different you know, shows across Radio 2. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it was one of the, one of the best uh, eight years I think I ever spent was on, on, that, on that network. I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, Terry Wogan stepping away from his Radio uh, 2 show at the end of the well, year. Well, he, he always used to say to me that, you know, he would he would hope he would never be pushed to leave and he hoped that he would always be able to know the moment when he should leave and, and he always wanted to be the person who made that decision. Never an easy decision to make. It's never easy to know when's the best time to go. What he didn't want to happen was to be was to hang on to that show and then through ill health or old age begin to sound uh, that he was uh, you know failing or sounding a little old um, and doddery so and, and he's, he's never been that uh, although you know he will pretend that he is but he's sharp as a pin and uh, I think it's right I think you know how many years 
can you carry on doing that? When is the right time to go? Who knows? But I think he's he's, he's he made the right decision, and uh, for his own sake of his own health, getting up that time in the morning and 